Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hoosier Theater. And welcome to Listen to Your Mother. Yes. We should all be doing that, right? I'm Tom Bilek. And I'm Michelle Piskel. And we are, uh, when we're not acting as MCs for Listen to Your Mother, which uh, will take a good bit of acting, by the way, uh, we are the Tom Fullery Fun Club. Yes, the Tom Fullery Fun Club has been in existence for eight years. We just had our eighth anniversary. Our shows feature some of the, well, thank you very much. Our shows feature some, what we think is some of the finest stand-up, improv, musical, and magical comedy available. Yes, we also have live bands, so music is infused in every show. Everything from jazz, rock, fusion, all of it. We have different shows every time. Comedians and music come together to make a unique experience every time you join us. And we're on a summer break right now, but we'll be back in the fall. And for more information about Tom Fullery, please go to... TomFulleryFunClub.com That's TomFulleryFunClub.com Thank you very much. Well, that's enough about Tom Fullery. That's Welcome. enough about Tom Fullery. Yes. Welcome to Listen to Your Mother. This is the Northwest Indiana premiere in Whiting, Indiana. Can we give us a round of applause for your joining us at the premiere in Whiting, Indiana? And welcome to the beautiful Hoosier Theater, by the way. Uh, this, this theater that you're seated in is uh, just about 100 years old. And some very famous performers have once set foot on this stage, such as W.C. Fields. The Three Stooges. Three Stooges, I know, that always yes. gets me too. Uh, how about Charles Lawton from the Hunchback of Notre Dame fam fame? Yeah, so a very historic building you're in today. And most recently, uh, the Eyes of March featuring Jim Peterick as part of a Tom Fullery event here a few years ago. That was kind of cool. Yes, we were able to have our show here twice. We've had two Tom Fullery Fun Club shows here at the Hoosier Theater. So welcome, and uh, welcome to Listen to Your Mother. Yes, so you're going to join us today in Whiting. Also tomorrow, there's a show, Listen to Your Mother, a very unique show that's very different than tonight, not exactly the same performances, and that will be at the Hobart Arts Theater. Tonight we'll have a plethora of topics related to motherhood. Some will make you laugh. Some will make you cry. And some will make you really cry, so just be, be aware of that. <laughs> make sure you have your tissues. Have your tissues ready, Tom? Do you have your tissue ready? I have a handkerchief, so I'm, I'm well stocked. Okay. At, at this time, we would like to thank, or like to welcome director, producer, and one of tonight's performers, Miss Carrie Bedwell. Please welcome Carrie. Good evening, and thank you for joining this wonderful event that helps create, create community and raise funds for charity for the 11th year in a row in Northwest Indiana. Ann Emig founded Listen to Your Mother with a show at the Barrymore Theater in Madison, Wisconsin on Mother's Day 2010 when she and 11 other local writers read their original true stories on motherhood before an audience of 300 people. The show became an instant sensation via creative online women growing into a grassroots phenomenon spanning 50 cities and 250 productions across North America, an acclaimed anthology from Putnam Books, a charitable giving movement which raised over $140,000, causes for women, families in need, plus a wide array of national media and press. In 2011, Stephanie Wilson brought the show to Memorial Hop Opera House in Valparaiso and would pass that torch on to Loveland Palm, who I was lucky enough to be, uh, have as a producer when I was casting the show in 2014. I was smitten with the show from the first moment that I took the stage and brought it to my hometown of Hobart, Indiana in 2018. Um, this year, we're lucky enough to have two shows, two completely different shows. We have this show here in Whiting, and then tomorrow again at 3 p.m. Um, in Hobart, but with other speakers, different stories. So if you're interested and you enjoy what you see tonight, come on out there at 3 p.m. tomorrow, Hobart Art Theater. If after the show is over and you think, I could do that, I wanna be in the show. Um, if you're on Facebook, do look for the 219 Writers Collective, where we'll host workshops with the goal of getting you on stage. Um, additionally, if you would like to help um, raise additional funds for St. Jude House, if you look on your uh, program, you'll see a Facebook page where we have lots of great items that we're currently uh, that we currently have up for auction. Okay, 
So can I have some applause if you've attended a Listen to Your Mother show before? Well, thank you for coming again. We appreciate it. Any first timers? All right, you're in for a treat. Do we by chance have any Listen to Your Mother alumni in the audience? No? I know we do up on stage. So you guys want to clap for your alumni? <laughs> All righty. So lastly, thank you for being here to support our cast members and St. Jude House. Before we get the evening started, I'd like to take a moment to th thank our Megaphone sponsors, because without them, these shows would not be possible. BP, the City of Whiting, The Times, Great News Life, Sugarfield Flowers, AMA Design and Print, Woman to Woman and Mom to Mom Magazines, Spare Room Studios, which is in the house tonight. Let's give her a round of applause. She did this cute decoration. Um, Painted Willow Designs made the Cheshire Cat, so yay. Um, picture a moment in time photography. Katrina Sebastian is here covering our show tonight, so let's give her a round of applause. And Joel Alderson uh, Photography. We appreciate your generosity and thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Ryan Elkanowski from St. Jude House to tell you a little bit about their mission. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. This is uh, such an honor uh, and an opportunity to, to thank you all and let you know a little bit about St. Jude House and how much uh, these funds really mean to us. Um, St. Jude House, we're a family violence prevention center and shelter located in Crown Point, Indiana. And I have the privilege of, of speaking here today because the, the vision of our founder, Mr. Don Burrell, Don sold his used car for, for $700 to start a business, a photo imaging lab in the basement of a church. During that time, he said a prayer to St. Jude, the patron saint of impossible or desperate causes. And that prayer was, if his business was to make it, he would do something so significant to honor St. Jude, and he didn't know what that would be. As time went on, Don Burrell's photo imaging lab grew to be the largest, um, most successful in the United States. And Don was at his business and he looked out the window and he noticed uh, his mostly female work staff. Don trusted females more because they're more responsible, <laughs> trustworthy. But he noticed those hard-earned paychecks. You have to go back in the day when there was paper checks. He noticed those checks being grabbed right out of the hands of his employees. He also noticed physical signs of domestic abuse. And Don knew he had to do something. So Don took his jet and he flew around the country looking at how to build the best domestic violence shelter. We opened our doors in 1995 and we were the first to publish our address so that women and children could easily find our services. A lot has changed since 1995, but we continue to serve. And events like this, and listen to your mother, this means so much because truly all of our services are at no cost. We've served 14,500 survivors since we've opened. And a lot of people think about domestic violence when they think about a shelter, they think about basic needs. And of course we have those. We have food, clothing, um, definitely the most safe place uh, around. But what people don't realize sometimes is that we have compassionate and comprehensive services. And what that means is we have a legal advocate that helps the survivors we serve navigate a complicated legal system, secure a protective order, go to court. We have a case manager. Within the first three days, we'll help identify goals, do a needs assessment, help with housing, employment. We have an adult advocate that will lead groups. We have financial empowerment, programming, domestic violence education, and we have a children's advocate that will do therapeutic activities, help enroll the children in school, we actually serve more, more children than adults. So it really takes a community, it takes partners, it takes people to, to understand the funds are so important, but also the awareness that people need to know that we exist if, if they need our services. We continue to innovate. We are looking at mobile advocacy. We're gonna hire two advocates to provide advocacy wherever a survivor feels safe. A, a true trauma-informed care survivor-led approach and I'm hopeful 
in the future that we'll come to a point where we look at domestic violence a different way. If I had $5 for everyone that told me they saw The Maid, right? The Netflix series. It's a great, it was a great portrayal. There was some very good accuracies in there. But we have to, to continue to, to, you know, the day when, when someone says, Ryan, why doesn't she just leave? And I say, well, why does he abuse? We need to come at a point where it's, it's, there's no judgment. We need to challenge the stigma. One of the biggest things survivors fear about coming forward to someone is uh, being told what to do. If we're there to listen and support, and, and a lot of you are here, I cannot tell you how much, how much this means to St. Jude House and, and to our organization. Because since March of 2020, the, the homicide rate in the state of Indiana is up 181%. So, as momentum and, and people who are, are truly caring about the mission, as you are here walking tonight, I applaud you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of our board of directors and staff. And I know you're in for a treat tonight. So thank you so much. Well, on with the program. Listen to your mother. You listen to your mother, don't you? I do. I just talked to my mom on the way here. I talked to her in the car. She's going to be um, visiting from Arizona. She told me, I thought it was going to be like a couple days. She's thinking like 10 to 14 days, but we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Well, I listen to my mother quite often, actually. Uh, you know, when I was in my late teens and early 20s, uh, my mom didn't really have too many of the answers for me. I, I, I didn't think she really knew all that much. And now some 40 years later, uh, she's got all the answers for me. <laughs> yes. And uh, I used to think she was kind of a slow learner, but uh, I think maybe I'm a slow learner. <laughs> Probably, I think so. I don't know the program, that's enough about me. I don't know the program. Um, mothers-in-law, any mothers-in-law people out there? Uh, mothers-in-law have strong emotions about them. You either love them or, well, maybe, maybe you don't. In Mothers-in-Law, Whiting's very own Mary Lou Cowley discusses her contentious relationship with her mother-in-law. Please welcome Mary Lou Cowley. I choose this one. Mothers-in-Law, the fact that the term alone conjures up negative images says a lot. Interesting factoid. The IRS considers your in-laws your relatives for life. You can divorce your spouse, but not your in-laws. When they told us that in tax class, there was a huge rush of groans across the classroom. The only thing that everyone in that class ever agreed on was that does not seem right. I myself have had two mother-in-laws, always been a bit of a comparison shopper, my first mother-in-law was a classic, you married my baby and I do not want to let him go. This mother-in-law character is something that is always missed when little girls are playing dress-up wedding. No one ever says, I want to play the mother-in-law. I had a male friend that frequently volunteered to be the bride, but, well, that's another story. But no one ever said, please, please, let me be the mother-in-law, and then proceeded to grab the make-believe groom ankles and be dragged down the aisle. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember the term even coming up. Were we not told of in-laws as children? Was it too scary? Maybe. Although my first mother-in-law did think the world of me and was very proud that her son was marrying me, I was a quiet, good Catholic girl who was active in church, didn't drink, didn't smoke, good student in school. However, there was just one problem. She just didn't want to let him go. And she didn't want to live alone. And she cried a lot. She cried on holidays. She cried at doctor's appointments. Although I don't think I realized it at the time, there was a teaching lesson here. Cry and you do cry alone. It was very hard to get to know her. And I only have one real memory with her. At the time, I had just begun dating her son, and she was making Polish pastry, which requires the beating of egg whites to very, very thin peaks, or high peaks, excuse me. It was only her and I sitting in her kitchen, and we were casually chatting, getting to know each other, 
and I thought she was sharing the recipe with me. I was excited, but I didn't realize it was actually a test. This many years later, I honestly don't know if I passed or not. She had beaten the egg whites to what I would say were medium firm peaks. I wouldn't have called them stiff. And she turned to me, and this normally motherly voice turned into interrogative homicide detective as she said, are these stiff enough? Her eyes glued to me, staring a hole through my tiny 18-year-old body. I think I quivered as I answered, and it was tough to answer. I thought that she probably, they should be higher, but what if that was the best peak she could make? Would I be insulting? Suddenly, I felt my whole future life depending on this answer. Finally, I think I got it out, yes, with 20 question marks following it. No, it should be stiffer. And then she continued with the process. No other words were spoken until she arrived at the perfect peaks and pointed at them. I was married to her son for 20 years, and I still really only remember that one conversation with her. <laughs> now, when I met my second mother-in-law, I was still the quiet, good Catholic, albeit divorced, girl active in her church that didn't drink and didn't smoke. I was feeling pretty confident to meet her. While her son had four children and a somewhat dramatic ex-wife, I was family oriented and thrilled to spend time with her grandchildren. Surely she would consider me such a catch, right? Wrong. <laughs> a Catholic girl active in her church is not high on the list of a rather strict Baptist. <laughs> she probably would have been happier had her son brought home a woman of ill repute that she could save. <laughs> it's very hard to save a Catholic. And then there was the aspect of her relationship with her four grandchildren. While her ex-daughter-in-law was finding her missed years, Pat, my next mother-in-law-to-be, had become their surrogate mom, so much more than their grandmother. She wasn't ready for an intruder, and I definitely was not her first choice. And Pat, who her youngest granddaughter refers to as filterless, could and would say anything. The daughter of a West Virginia coal miner who became a successful independent business owner with her husband, she was strong, she was bright, she made amazing crescent rolls, but she could be outspoken. That took a little bit of adjusting. I just wasn't prepared. But then there were the similarities. We both loved the same people. We both wanted the best for all of them. Sometimes different approaches. Slowly she realized this, and while we might have worshipped in different buildings, we worshipped the same God. And we had long talks on long car rides, going to weddings out east and graduations out west. Pat was as impulsive as I was slow to decide, so sometimes we didn't get each other. But instead of being at war over this, we ended up balancing each other. And when she would whip my always smudge glasses off my face to clean them for me, which at first I found a little invasive and in my face, in my space, I just began to expect it. And now I miss it. I don't think we were prepared to like each other. Love each other, yes, but like each other? It was the Christmas of 2017 when we were visiting, having a wonderful time with our balanced relationship, that she mentioned she had a doctor appointment for some stomach issues. We never saw it coming. Within a month, she was diagnosed with stage four uterine cancer. Of course, I went into support mode because that's what you do. And Pat and I prayed together. We both shared that faith in prayer and God, and we thought our family could get us through this. Our family fought for her to live. And when it became clear that we weren't going to get that, we tried to make the best of the last days. I had hopped up into her bed with her because she was already getting too weak to sit up in the easy chair. And then being a little filterless myself, I might have learned something from her. I said, you know, you're my favorite mother-in-law. And she said, and you're my favorite daughter-in-law. And then she laughed. And she said, I guess that might not actually be much of a compliment. And so we both laughed. We held hands. And then she said, you know, I didn't always know it, but you came into my life at exactly the right time. She died a month later. I remember her often. I have so many memories to choose from. Like the time we went to see Craig Ferguson live. I had no idea how the blue the show was. I swear to you, I did not know. 
And I was busy apologizing, and she said with this naughty little grin, I knew it would be like this. <laughs> and you still wanted to come? Mm -hmm. I miss her. I miss her saying inappropriate things. I so miss my friend that she became. Maybe we weren't supposed to be friends, but we both gave it what it took. I miss her cleaning my glasses. I'm so glad there are mothers-in-law. And next time my granddaughter plays wedding, I'm going to volunteer to be the mother-in-law. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. Well, now to our reader number two. For mothers who choose to breastfeed, society pressures of new mothers kind of make them feel inadequate when it's not easy to breastfeed. In Dear Mama, cast member Catherine Murphy shares her children's book, which can be found on Amazon, and it explores the frustrations of breastfeeding from the perspective of a child. So let's have a round of applause for the next reader. Catherine Murphy. So they say. But you and I find out that there's more than just one way. Our journey of breastfeeding may help others if shared. The way you sought the answers and how brave you were, though scared. You welcomed me with love. You put me upon your chest. Your smile and sweet embrace. I thought we both would rest. My sleep short and my breath heavy. I tried and tried to eat. Although my belly ached for more, we finally fell asleep. Someone came to wake us and recorded all my feedings. We tried again but couldn't latch, despite my many pleadings. You held me up ways and sideways and worry crossed your face. They told us it may take some time, then left without a trace. Home relaxed with cuddles, daytime was the best. I'd doze and coo, you'd smile and chuckle while bonding upon your chest. Twas nighttime that I struggled, in my crib alone would cry. My belly was not full enough from lack of milk supply. Dismayed, you took me somewhere new. The doc said, fails to thrive. From bonding to the bottle, shifting focus to survive. My belly full, but not quite the same. Mama, you looked so stressed. You nursed, then pumped, and bottle fed, while repeating, I'm truly blessed. Then, spit up and hiccups and tummy time shrieking, more advice given, you cried. My movements were painful and tries on my I couldn't express to you why. Thank you for not giving up on this, researching and chasing the why. Wanting more than to hear, it's common, don't worry. Upon scrolling, discovered tongue tie. New doctors and therapies helped you and me. Things shifted and began to feel right. Play became fun, no tell me time tears. Your smile turned hopeful and bright. Finally, it all came together. My tongue was released. You were nervous, I could tell. Yes, I cried, but I was okay. Once in your arms, all was well. Mama, please know I thank you. We are more than goals and charts. I'm grateful for your persistence, and I love you with all my heart. This journey is like no other. It's sweet, though sometimes tough. The choices you make for one with no voice. Mama, you are more than enough.
speaker, Eunice Jarrett's mother will turn 100 in June. 100. That's 100. Wow. Yes. She's seen a lot in her decades, which can teach many lessons. In I Listened to My Mother, Eunice shares her strong and brave mother with the audience. Please welcome Eunice Jarrett. this one. I listen to my mother. I listen to my mother, not so much when I was young, more as we grew older. She found freedom to speak from her heart, and I found a heart to listen. My mother had no formal music training, yet years ago she was asked to sing a solo for a religious sunrise service. She stepped to the ledge overlooking the Sea of Galilee as the sun warmed the horizon. Her song lingered in the air with the echo of worship. When people meet her, they often say, I want to be just like you. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes people want your glory when they don't know your story. My mother's name is Mary Burns, and she's trying her darndest to celebrate turning 100 years old tomorrow, May 1st. Watching world news, she often says, I've been there. She's traveled most of the continental states and Hawaii. Her passport has been stamped at many international sites far from her beginnings. She was born in Mississippi the eldest of 12 children. Her family lived in the country. That means water was pumped from a well and the bathroom was an outhouse. She was, she was small, nimble, and could run fast. A fallen log over a deep pond became her shortcut for errands. She knew she couldn't swim, so she knew she couldn't fall in. And she never fell in. When her mother would clean the house of a white family, she would take Mary to be the playmate of the child that lived there. One day as the two girls were playing, the little girl asked, Mary, don't you wish you were white? To which my mother replied, no, why would I? Well, when we grow up, you're gonna have to call me miss and say yes ma'am. Well that day, a young colored girl in Mississippi decided she would never call that selfish playmate Miss. Years passed and she met my father. They married and had four children in Mississippi. She told the story of him coming home from work very disturbed because he passed the bodies of two black boys hanging from the bridge he had to cross to come home. He told her it was time to leave Mississippi for the safety of their children. He went north first, staying with relatives in Hammond, Indiana. He got a job and sent for her. And in 1944, sitting with her four children in the colored section of the train car, the conductor said, ma'am, now you can sit anywhere you want because we have crossed the Mason-Dixon line. See, the Mason-Dixon line was the invisible line left over from the Civil War separating the North from the South. And I imagine my mother was looking reserved on the outside but shouting hallelujahs on the inside. Sometimes a memory triggered a story. She told of old unfair housing boundaries and the fear of being outside of our little neighborhood. One dark night, she was on the bus, going home from a meeting. The bus driver told her to get off the bus after the last white person left. She tried to explain she was going to the end of the line, but he decided that was the end of the line for her. With no, with no sidewalks, no street lights, no cell phones, she summoned feelings of safety by wrapping her fingers around her only weapon, a wooden pencil. A small woman walking in the dark alone, 
walking to where the bus driver would not take her. She recalled going to community meetings and being the only woman of color. Why? Because there weren't many of us from the South yet, and the few that were here knew acting as a regular citizen was considered being uppity, and being uppity was not safe in the South or the North. She once went to a PTA meeting where the group had painted themselves in blackface. She recently explained they were planning a minstrel show. Not expecting her, some thought it was funny when she saw their faces, and they hoped she would feel disgraced and never return. But that didn't work because the injustices placed upon her gave ways to new allies who stood by her side and became lifelong friends. And I want to shout out because these white women were no joke, especially allies from the League of Women Voters and Church Women United. Together, they helped build an inclusive sisterhood in Northwest Indiana. My mother raised 13 children. Her firstborn is Annie Burns Hicks. She became the first black teacher in the school city of Hammond after fighting and winning a federal court case. And this week, our family, our community, and the school city of Hammond celebrated the ribbon cutting of the Annie Burns Hicks Elementary School. Now my parents' branch of the family tree has over 85 leaves. 85 leaves that are glad she never fell in the pond. <laughs> she has been adopted by many people who affectionately call her Mother Dear. My parents' walls are covered with their awards for leadership, dedication, and inspiration from a grateful society. She has lived through 18 U.S. presidents, World War II, the Great Depression, many civil rights movements. She has traveled the world, but her story's not over. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Eunice. And please wish your mother a happy birthday tomorrow. Please, very courageous. Well, now we are on to our next reader. The road to motherhood isn't always easy. I can vote for that. In trust of your journey, Carrie Bedwell shows her, shares her journey on becoming a mom. Carrie Bedwell, Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Carrie Bedwell. The road to motherhood isn't often easy. Sometimes the path getting there is riddled with challenges, obstacles, and one may even begin to feel like a contestant vying for a prize on one of the many reality shows currently on television. But sometimes you have to trust your journey. Ready, set, go. It's time to get ready for your next challenge on the newest reality show, Survivor, the Motherhood Series. <laughs> You will be tested in areas of strength, endurance, agility, problem solving, teamwork, and willpower, all with the hope at the end of your journey that you will have a baby in your arms. Are you ready? Challenge number one. How badly do you want to become a mother, he asked. When you see a child on the street, do you want to steal him or her? Huh? What? Was he seriously asking me this question? The he was the first fertility doctor I visited. I wanted to scream, no, I'm not a nut job, a baby stealer. There won't be any lifetime movies about me. I've always wanted to be a mom. I'm maternal, can't he sense that? But he was, ex he was serious and expected a reply. No, I quietly responded as I strategized how I was going to get myself out of his office. He ordered a hysterosalpiogram, and during the procedure, the fallopian tube was found to be closed, was open, and staff seemed confident that pregnancy was imminent. Ah, a simple fix. I just knew he would be, I would be a mom soon and trusted my journey. Challenge number two. Months passed, and I still wasn't expecting. 
Time to try again, this time with a new doctor. Doctor number two was everything everyone said he was and more. He was easy on the eyes, and I couldn't keep my eyes off of his gorgeous baby blues. Although after several minutes of speaking with him, I had secretly decided he might be too gorgeous for the messiness of childbirth. He decided to take an alternative route and tested my husband. Tests were completed and we waited for our miracle answer. Would he provide the secret to becoming pregnant? I just knew he would and that my children were going to be just as beautiful as him. When we didn't hear from his office for an extended time, we called and were told by the nurse that she had placed the results on Dr. McDreamy's desk. And wait for it, he lost them. Dr. McDreamy? Apparently, although he excelled, and I mean excelled in looks and bedside manner, he lacked in organizational skills. No, we weren't going to take that test again and felt we needed to head in another direction. We trusted our journey. Challenge number three. Please complete these 25 documents, provide three different background checks, employment and financial history, get fingerprinted, share your life story and proposed parenting style in these five pages of forms, find three people to write letters of reference for you, and if all goes well, we'll come to your house for a four hour interview. Wanting to adopt a child was serious business. The average wait to be blessed via our agency was 18 months. I discerned that it wouldn't take us that long. I mean, two teachers who went above and beyond for their students, three adorable Labrador retrievers. I mean, everyone knows that they're great with kids. We traveled to Europe, what wasn't there to love? And after 10 months of being active, it finally happened. A young couple contacted us about adopting their child. See, I told you it wouldn't take that long. We met them. We loved them and they loved us. The chemistry between us was phenomenal. We sat through a five hour match meeting with them. We talked, we emailed, we built a relationship. We shopped for baby clothes together. We financed an ultrasound when at eight months her insurance had yet to come through. It's a boy! Oh, wait. The impending father has decided that since it is a boy, that he needs to pair it in order to carry on his family name to honor his deceased grandfather. We were heartbroken and felt defeated. Parenthood had been within our grasp. We wanted to give up, but we didn't. We trusted our journey. Challenge number four. It's two years and three months into being active with our agency. We have far surpassed the average weight. We were discouraged and we were starting to give up on the idea of parenthood. I had finally come to terms that becoming a mom was the one goal in life I would have to forego. The realization sunk in that I would never be called mommy. I would never experience sleepless nights caring for a baby. I would never change the grossness of diapers, read my child a bedtime sto story, or bandage his scraped knee. There would be no child to lead through life or leave my legacy. This all hit me like a ton of bricks. I had given up and waved my white flag and surrender. Tuesday, January 14th, 2014. I'm at work on my prep period, grades are due, and I'm being evaluated by my assistant principal the next hour. Could the day get any crazier? Well, you know, of course it could. The phone rang at 8.05 a.m. and I saw the agency's name scroll across the caller ID. Oh, I thought. Our social worker had been on me about updating information and adding fresher pictures to our profile. Admittedly, I'd been putting it off. I was tired and I'd given up. I didn't want to answer, but I did. Hi, Carrie, it's Kathy. How are you, she asks. I tell her I'm fine, and she proceeds to tell me I'm about to be even better. A 26-year-old woman in Indianapolis has given birth to a little boy and has chosen you and Rob to be his parents. 
When can you get here? And oh, the doctor wants to know if you want him circumcised. <laughs> Wait, what? Everything is a blur. I notify secretarial staff that we will need our classes covered, finish grades, get evaluated, and we are on our way. As we entered the hospital room, I didn't know what to expect. In the bed sat a beautiful brown-haired woman with the most gorgeous eyes and long eyelashes holding a tiny being. She handed all seven pounds, 14 ounces of him to me. Is this really happening? After all the challenges and heartache, could this have just fallen into place? Then it hits me. I'm a mom. I will experience sleepless nights. I will change the grossness of diapers, read bedtime stories, and bandage his scraped knees. I will guide him through life, and he will be my legacy. The birth of Thayer Ellis Bedwell made me a mom. He is the best gift I have ever received and the greatest surprise of my life. He was more than worth the wait. So glad we trusted our journey. Congratulations, Carrie. Thank you. Very nice. Mothering is hard, or so I'm told. Mothering four children at four different stages can often seem impossible. Right? Are you familiar? Yes, very. <laughs> in the mother load, Brittany Dawson shares the day in the life of her motherhood experience. Please welcome Brittany Dawson. Seven twenty-eight a.m. Shit! What time is it? Okay, good. Baby's still asleep. Oh, but who's screaming downstairs? Where's Matt? Did Gavin wake up? I've been awake for 30 seconds, and my day is already weighing on me. I roll out of bed, and Claire, my seven-year-old, is outside waiting for the bus, wearing pink sweatpants that are too small and covered in stains. Oh, God, I hope she doesn't have on the matching sweatshirt. It's even worse. Damn it, she's not wearing her snow boots. I watch her kick snow up around her ankles and canvas tennis shoes. I hope her feet aren't wet all day. She looks like no one takes care of her. Should I run her boots out? Never mind, it's too late. I see the bus and she's off. 7.35. Pour myself a cup of coffee and Fiona is bouncing around asking for Spider-Man. It's already on the TV. And crying for cereal already in her bowl. I attempt to reason with her, but she's two. It's futile. 8.06. Phoebe, 12 weeks old, is asleep for now, but only because she was raging four hours ago. I pumped for 30 minutes, eight ounces, and it feels like quite the accomplishment. This is honestly the most productive thing I will do with my entire day. Matt, my husband, carries Phoebe downstairs as I'm unplugging, and the next hour is a blur. I know that I started nursing her on the left side at 9 a.m. because I downloaded this handy-dandy tracker for feedings and sleep, my brain is so frazzled that I would have zero sense of what happened when without it. And I also know that I had to get up three times and remove Fiona from the bathroom sink. She keeps coating herself in hand soap. 10.39, Instagram notification. Distraction, distraction, distraction. My favorite influencer, it feels embarrassing to even admit that I have favorites, but my favorite inf influencer has just had a baby too, her second. But she obviously has a lot of money. Shares, drinks, uh, shares links to $328 pairs of jeans kind of money. And I have way more kids and way less money. And that's why this looks hard and doesn't feel Instagrammable, right? This place is trashed. Literally crayons on the carpet in the back room since I think Monday. What's today? Friday? 1048. We are midway through a second Spider-Man movie. After this, I will turn off the TV. We cannot do this all day. But it's okay right now. I need Fiona to be occupied while I'm nursing Phoebe. I'm glad I downloaded this app to track the nursing because now I know I'm not crazy to feel like this is all I do. I have fucking proof it actually is all I do. <laughs> Phoebe has been working on the right side for 56 minutes now. And no, she's not asleep and using me as a pacifier. She's ravenous and digging her sharp baby nails into the skin around my breast. I look like I had a topless run-in with a thorn bush. 
10.55, Fiona does a somersault on the eight inches of cushion between me and the side table, kicking over my mug of cold coffee, and now it's everywhere, including the baby's head. Oh good, she's done nursing. 11.17, oh, I need Phoebe to nap, and then I can feed myself. Oatmeal with flaxseed because it's supposed to be good for milk production and she eats for seven hours at a time. 11.37, why is your diaper off? It's stinky. I follow Fiona into her room for a new diaper. I use wipes to clean cereal milk off her hands and her chest and her neck. I have no idea when she had her last bath. Sadly, this is not an exaggeration. When Phoebe is finally asleep, that's right, she's still awake, I will make my oatmeal and give Fiona a bath. 11.45, my no more babies alarm. I love these kids, I do, but I cannot have another. I'm not doing a very good job at it, and I don't want to inflict any more of this on any more of them. 11.55, Phoebe is finally drifting off while I hold her. I lay her in the bassinet as gently as possible, leaving both hands in place for about 60 seconds before slowly sliding them away one at a time. She is live ammunition, but instead of exploding, if I make one false move, I will restart the nurse, burp, play, rock to sleep cycle and melt down on the inside. This time, I am successful, and I let out a sigh of relief. The door opens. Fiona is charging up the stairs, determined to wake my sweet baby bomb. I can hear the third Spider-Man starting. I let out another sigh, disappointment. 12.35, Phoebe is awake. I haven't even finished making my oatmeal yet. The third Spider-Man movie is off, but a Spider-Man cartoon is on. I am exhausted. 12.42, nursing again. I finish making my oatmeal and then furiously rummage through the cabinet in search of an open bag of semi-sweet chocolate chips so that I can throw back a handful as a reward for making it this far in the day. A treat to encourage myself through the next round, but I can't find the bag. Fiona is wearing only a diaper. I didn't bother dressing her after the last diaper change because I thought, I'm just getting ready to put her in the bath. But we never made it to the bath, and now I'm on the couch for another marathon nursing session, so who knows when it will happen. At least I have my oatmeal. 119. Fiona is force feeding me blackberries. She's helped herself to the whole container. She sneezes on the berries in her hand. 139. Fiona has bounced out all the energy and is sleeping next to me on the couch, face very stained, still no clothes. Phoebe is still nursing. Phoebe is so, so, so sweet. Smiley, cuddly, beautiful baby. And I know she is my last baby and it pains me to pack away her tiny clothes as she outgrows each piece. But all I want to do is put her down and walk away. Every move I make is an attempt to get these kids in some sort of position that allows me to step out of this role for a couple hours without feeling like things will come undone. I want to experience the freedom that lasts longer than it takes for my shower to run out of hot water without feeling guilty. And vocalizing all this does feel cliche. Oh, the weight of motherhood. But it is heavy. 209. Fiona is still asleep on the couch. Phoebe is milk drunk and her eyes are heavy. I carry her upstairs to try for a nap again, but before I place her in the bed, she flashes me an open mouth smile, and I stare at her for one minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know. I do know that by the time I recover and lay her down, she's ready to wake up again. 2.29, Claire is home from school. When she removes her coat, I see that she did not wear the matching sweatshirt. She is wearing two construction paper and yarn Olympic medals around her neck. She got the gold in CVC words, best in her class, and I couldn't be more proud. My son, Gavin, on the other hand, is failing ninth grade. Literally an F in every class but gem. He tests extremely well, so the school counselor believes we can solve the problem by scheduling him for mostly AP classes next year. This feels reckless to me. But I'm willing to give it a shot because planners and post-it notes, punishments and rewards, emails to teachers and ADHD medication, limited screen time, and straight up fighting with him have not been helpful. The more I fixate on fixing his grades, the more terse our communication is altogether. I miss actually enjoying my time with him, and I feel guilty for not. Four o'clock. Phoebe is awake. 
Fiona has a wig. Gavin is home. I share my day with Matt, asking for feedback, but not judgment. He listens, but is obviously hurt. It reminds me that it's not all on me, and I am free to leave. I say, I know. But it doesn't feel like I've earned the break. My baby won't sleep. The crayons are still on the floor. I let Spider-Man babysit my naked toddler. I have absolutely nothing to show for my day, and all of my days look the same right now. The weight of this reality is crushing me. 522. Phoebe has been nursing for a full hour again. Matt has been cleaning as if we're expecting company. I think it's to make me feel better, or to make him feel better. Either way, it's appreciated. I take Phoebe back upstairs to try to put her to sleep. Fiona follows me. The cat follows her. We all hide in my bedroom away from the back room. Six o'clock. Phoebe still won't sleep. I carry her downstairs, and Matt has cleaned the entire main floor in maybe 90 minutes tops. This was impossible for me. I felt like I was buried under the clothes and the clutter and the crayons on the floor. And he also has the bath running for Fiona. More weight off the mother load. I have been straining. Why? I've been straining to carry everything by myself, convinced that dropping the pieces spelled doom for us all. But this was never meant to be a one-person job. I needed to let things slip in order to allow someone else to pick them up. And I am just as much their mother in the absence of contrived perfection, perhaps more. No words, but I hug Matt in the kitchen, and we squeeze each other as tightly as we can until Phoebe breaks the silence by breaking wind, audibly. <laughs> she feels noticeably lighter, and so do I. So much lighter. Oh my gosh, she must be so tired. <laughs> this must be the most rest you've had all week. <laughs> you want a glass of wine or something? <laughs> Okay, got a glass of wine over here. <laughs> yes. Wow, waitressing in college, speaker Ella Bell witnessed an encounter between a mother and a son that she'll never forget, and that has shaped her motherhood journey. Welcome Ella, reading Unseen. Single moms, they're everywhere, right? Easy to spot. She's the frazzled one in the store with one too many kids hanging off of her. They've got runny noses. Probably at least one is crying. You teeter between sympathy and annoyance. Yeah, you see single moms all the time. When I was in college, I was waiting tables at a really average family restaurant. One night, I saw a woman and her young, possibly preteen son come and sit in my section. They were both happy and the boy looked excited. When I went to the table, the mom told me that it was her son's birthday. Happy birthday, I said, and handed them their menus. The mom then took a napkin and covered up part of the boy's menu. Don't look at that part, just look at this part, she said. The boy was caught off guard and looked startled. I knew why. His mother had covered up the prices. He was to order what he wanted, not what was the cheapest. I knew that mother had saved up and gone without in order to make that dinner happen. I knew that because I had a single mother who had done the same when I was younger. I knew that probably no one in that entire restaurant saw that woman and thought, oh, a single mom. No one probably noticed her at all. But I saw her. And though I didn't know it at the time, there would be a point in my life that I would be her. I've had friends, well-meaning friends, say that they know what being a single mom feels like because their husbands are working midnights that week. So they haven't had any help at bedtime or bath time for three nights in a row. Once, a father said to me that he could really use some help one evening getting one of his kids home from baseball practice. I quote, all three of my kids had places to be tonight and my wife is out of town. Now I see how it feels to be a single parent. I've listened to the chatter at PTO meetings about women's husbands being gone on extended leisure or business trips and how that has to be practically one and the same thing as being a single mom because while he's the cook and having to figure out an Uber Eats order every night is such a hassle. In all my years as a single mother, a real one, an Uber Eats order has never been a dilemma that has almost broken me. Single motherhood doesn't look like that. That is not how it feels. 
And hearing things like that makes a single mom feel invisible, unseen. What being a single mom does feel like is standing in line at the grocery store, avoiding eye contact with anyone behind you, and praying that the accepted foods covered by your WIC checks hasn't changed recently, because that will hold up the entire line as the cashier calls for help, pulls out the WIC flyer, and tells you what you have to put back. You'll want to disappear. Being a single mom is waking up everyone in the middle of the night because you can't get the littlest guy's fever to break and you have to get to the store for Tylenol. It's loading them all in their pajamas into the car and explaining that everyone has to go because there is no one to watch them so you can make the trip alone. It's hearing someone in the store say, doesn't she know how not to get pregnant? It's juggling jobs and only being able to apply for jobs that will give you a schedule that lets you be home when the kids are sick. It's losing those jobs because you call off too much when they are sick. It's the daycare drop-off nightmare when they scream for you to stay and you physically ache as you have to walk away while a stranger holds their trembling, crying little body. It's selling furniture on Facebook Marketplace to pay the NIPSCO bill and buying clearance Halloween toys in anticipation of Christmas coming up. You know you can use them as presents if you take them out of the orange and black packaging, rewrap them up, and play them off as costumes and props for the dress-up bin. It's the humility you feel in the line at a food pantry on Monday and Thursday mornings and the prayers you say begging God to never let your kids remember. And if they do, let them just always think of it as they do now. The cute little church that gives us bread sometimes. It's praying that it doesn't snow as much as they say it will because shoveling that driveway before they wake up and have to walk down to the bus is so exhausting. But they are so little and the snow gets so deep and they have to have a path. It's knowing that a clogged tub and broken sump pump is something you have to figure out on your own because there's no one coming home at the end of the day that can help you. And if your Google search is right about what a plumber will charge, that is not an option. It's watching them score a soccer goal that you have worked all week on in the yard with them and wanting so badly to turn to someone next to you and high five them because look, he did it, our guy did it. But there's no one to high five. It's wrapping Christmas presents alone at two in the morning, so excited for them to wake up and wanting someone else to be there and share it and to just love them as much as you do and be so excited to see their faces too. It's hanging up streamers all over the house by yourself after they go to bed the night before their birthday so they wake up to a surprise. It's sitting in the audience alone at the school concerts wishing someone else could just feel a fraction of the joy that little boy just singing his nervous little heart out on that stage brings to your life. And that's the easy stuff. The hard stuff comes in waves and feels like it could drown you at any moment. The hard stuff is when you feel like you have failed them every day because you've lost your temper, again. You've yelled, again. You won't let them watch movies with bad language, but they know bad words because you've used them. Again. It's the worrying every day, every single day. Are they going to be good people when they grow up? Are you setting the right example? A good, kind, faithful example. Are you getting any of this right? Do they know how much you love them? You know how much they love you because they have forgiven you every time you have failed them and loved you fiercely through rock bottoms that they never should have had to see. It's the day that you knew was coming, that you thought you could be ready for, but there was no way to prepare you for how it would feel. Your body had given birth to this precious little boy, but that physical pain was nothing compared to this. Your knees weakening, stomach churning, and heart literally breaking as he looks up on that unavoidable day, eyes wide and heart open, and you know what he is going to say, but oh God, how are you going to answer him? And his little mouth starts to move and everything seems like it's going slower than it should and maybe it's not gonna happen, but it is and it does. And his little voice says, why don't I have a dad? You swoop him up and you hold him so tight and you can't even breathe and you want to crumble, but you can't. And you use the best words you can think of to explain something he cannot comprehend and soften a blow that he should never have to endure. And then there's the good stuff. It's the high five you do get when they make that soccer goal because they run to you and put their little hand up for you to hit. It's the magic in their eyes that you and you alone get to see on Christmas morning. 
It's when they crawl into bed with you and say, Mommy, I'm scared. Even, even though you are tired, so very tired, they say, Mommy, you are where I feel safe. It's the pride you feel when they say prayers at night for kids at school that are being teased. It's the grace you see them give to others, and it's the grace they give to you. It's the laughing and the crying and the yelling and the hugging after you yell because your load is so heavy, but they, they are not. They are quite literally the breath in your lungs and every single beat of your heart. And it's the conversation you have with your son one day about why some people have things harder than others. Why does God put hard things on good people? You certainly don't have the answer, but your son shares his thoughts. Maybe, Mom, maybe it's to see if the rest of us are genuine, to see if we will notice them and be sincerely kind and love them. And there is no part of you that can stop the tears that come, because there it is. They are going to be okay. They are going to be good people. They already are. And someday, if they are ever in a restaurant and a woman comes in with her child and she takes a napkin and covers up half of the menu, they are going to see her. Thank you for sharing that. Everyone recalls the day they became a parent and the plan they had in place to make sure the process went very smoothly. Remember that day? Many of them. <laughs> it doesn't go smoothly. However, the best laid plans can go awry and one is forced to roll with the punches. Join us in welcoming Paul and Bennett Galvin as they share the story of the day their son was born in We Had a Plan. Okay, it starts on Monday. Little Bubby is clear for takeoff. Head down, face down, and dilated a centimeter. In other words, he'll be sliding out in the best position. Remember this, because it comes back later. <laughs> and then Friday morning, around 7 a.m. Did you pee the bed? That's not pee. We spent our entire pregnancy in San Francisco. <clears throat> but moved to Oakland three weeks before he was due. Still, we insisted that we give birth to the hospital in San Francisco. It was part of our birth plan. It was no problem because our friend Karen promised to drive us to San Francisco when the baby was due. And we had an appointment scheduled anyway. Eight, six, four, nine, six. She's not answering. So I race after her, leaving her pregnancy bag and grabbing my empty wallet. I waddle to the bus stop at about three blocks downhill, and we are off. She leaves a trail of amniotic fluid. Straight hours that follow for days. <clears throat> Next stop, a crowded BART train. Imagine a subway, but with cloth seats. <laughs> Sitting on the BART train in the middle of the commute, I start my contractions. The woman next to her asks, are you in labor, ma'am? As I leak all over the seat. I apologize to anyone who sat there throughout the day. Finally, we get to San Francisco only to find that Paul has no cash, no ATM card to pull money for a quick taxi ride. Bus to the hospital, but luckily it's an express bus. It only stops at half of the thousand potential stops through Chinatown. But hey, at least you get a seat when commuters realize you're about to pop. Time for my appointment, so I waddle quickly, still leaking, to our nurse practitioner, Winnie. We sign in, I damage another seat, and then we go to the room. Winnie walks in, smells the air. I love the smell of amniotic fluid in the morning. <laughs> Takes one look at us and sends us to the hospital next door. I stomp next door, uphill to the hospital, only to find a line. Just so you know, 
This is the autumnal equinox. Say what you will about full moons and timing, but this place was packed. We were at least six pregnant women deep, including one who was doing yoga in the middle of the room, foot behind her neck. We hated her. I called a friend to bring me food and cigarettes for most support. She came with a burrito for me and a fruit salad for Ben. What to expect when you're expecting told me I wouldn't be hungry. Wrong. She decimated that burrito. After sending several people to Oakland to give birth, including yoga woman, we clapped when she left. We got a room. We hooked her up to the monitors and did an all time to check on Bubby. Remember when I said Bubby was head down, face down in the birth canal? Yeah. Let me tell you something about our kid. He has always done things on his own schedule. Talk basically went from three sounds to full sentences. Well, this was our first introduction to this pattern. But it was a surprise when we learned that he had spent his last week in the womb, turning around and crossing his legs as if he wasn't coming out without a fight. <laughs> the ultrasound tech says, are you aware your baby's breech? My mouth drops off. Paul walks off. Where did he go? I went to the doctor's office. I said, I need to see Winnie, and they just pointed to the door. I sat down and told Winnie it was breached. She said, I thought she might be when I saw her. Meanwhile, I think he has bailed on me. Wait, will I be a single mother? No place to stay? Help! Okay, I'm back. What is So an intern comes in with a smile and announces, time for your C-section. Happy that the birth will be at least to stay for him. Okay, I did not haul my cookies all the way across the bay for a C-section. I had a birth plan. My reply to the intern with a wipe that smile right off his face. I just ate a burrito, and I want drugs. Go big or go home. If I wasn't getting my granola-eating, cult of motherhood, California mom-approved doula in the room, natural childbirth in a birthing room with sage burning, and the, all the other things in this birth plan, give me my epidural now. Epidural in, TV on, I would watch the contractions on the monitor. A great moment on Beverly Hills 902 was happening when they rolled me into the operating room. So, a little background around me. I hate all things medical. I faint at the sight of blood. So my quasi-doula, Zan, the burrito delivery woman who's, who, and friend who stayed, had these smelling salts in her hand to revive Paul. But my anesthesiologist, he knew a fainter when he saw one. So he paid a lot of attention to Dad. At the foot of the, at the table was the head of OBGYN at the hospital, about 10 medical students, interns, residents. They could have been foreign tourists for all I know. <laughs> they were all huddled around my enormous belly looking at my private parts. I was entertained while talking motorcyclists with the anesthesiologist. And I was completely ignored until the head of surgery cut his hand and mixed it with my blood. HIV, HEP, A, B, or C? All was well, nobody had AIDS, but it added to the excitement. <laughs> Bubby is born. What's his APGAR score? I carried him off while they sewed her up. They spent three days at the hospital while I realized the changes coming in our lives. This is our birth story. Sometimes painful, messy, comical, but always ours. Life doesn't always go as expected, so be flexible, be prepared, and maybe skip the burrito during medical exams. Very nice. Thank you so much. You got some nice laughs there. That's good. <laughs> Okay, you know, there are several animals in the animal kingdom, and you know, a lot of times people look to animals and look to childbirth. Well, here's one. Elephants are known to help each other through the trials and tribulations of motherhood. As Mary Cameron becomes a became a single mother, 
She couldn't help but notice the similarities between her tribe and a herd of mama elephants. In Elephants, Mary recounts a personal story. So give a round of applause to Mary Cameron. Welcome, Mary. It was elephants that got me through some of the hardest times in my life. To remind me of that, I wear a ring of elephants on my finger. Elephants are amazing for many reasons, but they are particularly inspiring when they are in danger. Now, they are huge and don't have many animal predators, so really the only time one is vulnerable or fragile is when she is giving birth. When it is time for one mother elephant to bring her baby into the world, all the other females in the herd form a circle around her to protect her during this time of transition. They stand like that no matter how long it takes. When the baby is finally born, they all start stomping their feet and trumpeting loudly in celebration. While the transformation into a mother for the first time is extraordinary, it is not the only vulnerable transformation we go through as women and mothers. Our children grow, needs change, and we have to change with them. Motherhood is about facing the unique challenges of our family and adapting and changing to meet those challenges. Like many of you, my motherhood journey was not the picture-perfect one I had imagined for myself. To begin, it started off a little bit delayed. I tried unsuccessfully for years to have children. I visited many fertility doctors, tried different medication, and even had a failed adoption of a little boy I still think about sometimes. It can be easy to shy away from people going through difficult things because we don't know how to help them. We feel self-conscious of our own inadequacies when it comes to consoling the grieving and worry that our own happiness could magnify their sorrows, so we create distance between us. I was blessed during this difficult time to have women and mothers who did just the opposite. My friends were involved in my journey and learned about the medications and procedures I was undergoing. Each month, they shared in my hope and then cried with me as it remained unfulfilled. They waited through paperwork for adoption and helped me pack and then unpack a bag for a trip I never got to take to pick up a baby. And through it all, they were not afraid to bring me into their families. They let me cuddle and mother their babies until I was able to have my own. I am so thankful I got to be a mother long before I had a child. Because I struggled with fertility issues for a while, I had some extra time to think about the kind of mother I was going to be someday. I had it all figured out. I read all the books, followed all the blogs, and researched all the products. I knew what my own parents had done right and what they had done wrong. As I watched the mothers around me, I cataloged, judged, and sorted them into categories based on what I deemed as good motherhood and what I was absolutely never going to do. I knew exactly what I was going to teach my children and the people they were going to be. And then along came my son, Cameron. Cameron is smart and funny and kind and has autism. Having a child with special needs that aren't obvious when you look at him made me realize how harsh of a judge I had been to other mothers. It opened my eyes up to the fact that we learn to be the mothers we need to be instead of the mothers we wanted to be. And often, that is so much better than we originally thought. I have learned a lot from Cameron, like loving people for who they are instead of who we wish they were, and giving them love in ways they feel it best. He teaches me to not compare myself to others and to focus on what really matters instead of what society values. I learned quickly who my real friends were, the people that make comments to me connecting Cameron's behavior to ways I was lacking as a mother are not my people. The people who matter are the ones who love me and my boy, even on his bad days. They know that I need the Wi-Fi password as soon as I get to their house, in case Cameron needs to listen to a calm down song. They understand that I have to leave early sometimes or cancel unexpectedly when there is a meltdown. They make sure my younger son, Silas, is happy and distracted while I wade through the trenches of sensory overload with Cameron, and then give me a hug while I cry afterwards because it is so emotionally draining. They tell me I am a good mother. Even on days when I feel like I am failing and cannot see brighter days ahead. Cameron and my friends teach me to give those around me grace and love because they are likely hiding pain I can't see. Thank goodness for Cameron, and then I get to be his mama. And thank goodness for his younger brother, who happens to be neurotypical. As I had my second child, and worked to adjust to Cameron's increasing needs, my marriage became an unstable and unsafe place. 
My husband at the time became emotionally and then physically and sexually abusive. I struggled to balance being a mother, managing my own needs, and trying to save my marriage. After years of bearing this burden, it was time to make a change. I was terrified to make that change and face all the obstacles that came next, but finally decided that my boys deserved to be raised in a home that was filled with love instead of fear and anger. And even though it was hard for me to see it at first, I eventually learned that I deserved that as well. My next motherhood challenge was going back to school and re-entering the workforce after many years of staying at home, while at the same time adjusting to being a single mother of two small boys. Juggling a full graduate degree program while working and being a mother was challenging, and honestly, it's still a little bit of a blur. Looking back, it is hard to understand how I was able to do so much while also healing from an abusive marriage. That time was one of the hardest of my life, but it was another time to see the amazing women in my life in action. For a while, I struggled to eat, and I had friend, a friend bring me food and make me eat it so I could stay healthy. I had a friend bring me flowers so I would know I was loved and deserved good things. I had friends help watch my children so I could go to therapy sessions to begin the healing process. My amazing friends held me when I cried, told me I was strong even when I felt weak, and celebrated with me during any victory, big or small, along the way. My simple ring made up of small elephants means a lot to me. I originally wore my circle of elephants on my right ring finger, because that is the finger my ex-husband broke once when he was mad at me. That, remainder, that reminder that sat on this once broken part of me reminds me that I can heal, I can transform, I can be strong and brave, and I don't have to be alone while I do it. All of these motherhood struggles taught me so many lessons that can apply to your life as much as mine, but one of the biggest was the importance of those elephant circles in our lives. Our culture emphasizes that being strong and independent means we hide our struggles and never need help. We worry about being an inconvenience to those around us, and while we are so caught up in our own problems, those around us are doing the same. We learn to survive on our own, but we aren't meant to. We're meant to be elephants. We're meant to circle around one another and allow ourselves to be encircled. During all those times of pain, healing, and transformation in my motherhood and personal journey, I've been encircled like a mother elephant by people in my life. They have all played different roles, but each has stood guard while I was vulnerable and fragile. And the stronger and braver I got, the more they celebrated my victories with me. Knowing how to help someone struggling with infertility, learning to navigate through life with a child with special needs, transitioning to being a single mother, an abuse victim trying to break free, or any of the other millions of struggles we carry can seem overwhelming and daunting. What can we possibly do to combat the pain that our sisters in motherhood feel? The support and love my elephants gave to me and that we need to give to each other is simple. Stand with the mothers around you. You don't have to know the right words to say or have something big to do to lighten their burden. The most meaningful thing that we can do for each other is love each other. Understand that we may not see all the pain and burdens someone else carries, so act in love always. And when we are honored enough to be shown those struggles, give them a safe place to be vulnerable and scared while they get stronger, and then celebrate with them when they're ready to stand up and take steps again. My ring reminds me that no matter what else I have to walk through, I have elephant sisters in my life that will see me through it. And as much as it reminds me that we all pass through times where we need to stay safely within our circle and accept help from others when it comes, it also reminds me of the sacred responsibility we have to stand in the circle of our fellow mothers. The inspiring stories we've heard from these amazing women here tonight mirror the ones I know you all carry in your hearts. My journey and struggles are not special or unique. They are just a reality of life. Elephants circle around a vulnerable mother to protect her and cheer her progress. As human mothers, that's what we need from each other, and that's what we must give each other. May each of us find our elephant circle, and may each of us be that elephant circle, because we're all sisters in the same herd. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for sharing that. Speaker Janine Harrison has experienced it all divorce, addiction, and a stay at St. Jude House, and especially perseverance. In Listen to Your Mother's Hug, Make Sense of Her Story, please welcome Janine Harrison. I'm going to 
use this one. <laughs> According to writer Anne Lamott, the most pro profound thing we can offer our children is our own healing. You never liked tugging, Sally, when you were little, my much older half-sister Donna told me once regarding my relationship with my mom. I tucked the tidbit away for safekeeping. My mom, born in 1925, had a 151 IQ and was valedictorian of her small rural Minnesota high school. The town lawyer wanted to hire her as his secretary upon graduation, but the minute that she had attained her diploma, she and her older sister, Levina, made a beeline for the big city, in this case, Minneapolis. Due to the Great Depression, World War II, and prescribed gender roles for women, my mom never attended college or enjoyed a career, instead serving as an administrative assistant. But she was a voracious reader, could correct college graduates' writing, and taught me a tremendous amount about life. Everything, that is, except about how to have personal boundaries. Mom was empathetic, generous, and low maintenance. Hell, that woman was the giving tree, which sadly made her an easy target. To illustrate, her sister lost part of a finger while working in an ammunition factory during World War II. After her severance pay, no pun intended, ran out, Levina simply refused to work anymore. Although she and my mom were both single women in their 20s sharing an apartment together. So my mom's pittance of a paycheck had to keep them both afloat for the better part of a decade until Levina got married and her husband took over her care. Only then did my mom move to Chicago and carry on with her life. Later, when my mom said yes to my dad's marriage proposal, he told her, no wife of mine is going to work, so she quit her job. To best characterize their marriage, I offer that I once told my mom that she reminded me of Edith Bunker. <laughs> Mouth a straight line, she replied, thanks a lot, kid. I hadn't meant in intelligence or voice, though. I'd meant that my dad sat in his chair and my mom ran around the house taking care of his every whim. Him always the center, him the decision maker, him the disciplinarian, her without say so, her without complaint, even though her knowledge and understanding of the world could have skated circles around his own. Via example, she raised me to be just like her which served me poorly during my adolescent and young adult years. Because my dad was an alcoholic and my much older half-brother, a Vietnam vet with severe PTSD, a coke addict, I devoted a couple of decades of my life to trying to save substance abusing men from themselves before I had to cry uncle, face the fact that only they could save themselves and save myself instead. Unsurprisingly, early on, I was a problem drinker too. During my first marriage to another adult child of an alcoholic who drank a lot, I made him vow, if we have children and one of us has a drinking problem, let's promise that the other one will leave with them. Even at age 24, this was important to me because when my dad got bad toward the end of his life and I asked my mom to leave my father, she responded, then who would take care of him? My mom had boundaries neither for herself or for me. Fortunately, my starter marriage dissolved sans children. Unfortunately, I moved on to a relationship with an addict that would get me in way over my head on and off again for close to a decade and almost destroy me. It would also create my one biological child, daughter Gianna, for whom my love is rightly boundless. Ironically, the worst person in my life created the best person 
in my life. On our last go, her biological father would say he was clean, but he had, in effect, become a more deceptive drug user. Still addicted, he became increasingly abusive to me and threatened my and our baby's life while I was pregnant. For a long time, I had been more afraid for him than I was of him, but while expecting, that changed. I knew that I had to protect Gianna and to survive to raise her. One morning, I dropped him off at work with no intention of returning to pick him back up. Instead, I packed the car and drove three-month-old Gianna and, and myself to a prearranged appointment at St. Jude's house. One eviction notice and one order of protection later, we were physically free of him, and I've worked to establish better boundaries ever since then, Bounding boundaries that my mother never developed. One afternoon, during her final year of life, my mother came to me in tears and out of the blue asked, why was my father so mean? Here she was, 76 years old, finally processing her girlhood trauma. Come to find out, she was so scared of her dad that once, partway home from high school, she realized that she'd forgotten to buy his chewing tobacco in town and that it was too late for her to turn back. She walked the rest of the way home to the farm and went straight to bed, skipping dinner so as to avoid his wrath. Once, too, her father broke her, her brother Ron's collarbone with a pitchfork. That's why she stiffened when hugged, even for me, her little girl. I didn't want to pass trauma down to a third generation, not only in lack of boundaries, but also in the form of an unhealthy relationship to touch, which, after abuse, mine had become. Therefore, I made a conscious effort to make certain that didn't happen, that my baby girl has grown up with all the love I could possibly muster, squeezed into my hugs. I hope she listens to what they tell her. Thanks. Being a mom can be stressful, and being a mom can be amazing. In Confessions of a Stressed Out Mom, Melissa Sinkinger, 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 I hope I say this right, dishes her secrets to surviving motherhood unscathed. Let's learn, I'm paying attention to this, I want to come out of this unscathed. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> was easy back then. Well, easier. I'm talking about the post-wivery, pre-motherhood phase of life. A blissful time where errands could be run at will and dinner could be consumed in fine establishments. My identity composed of family, friends, summer festivals, and Zumba. Flash forward to grocery deliveries in Amazon Prime, drive through windows and curbside pickup, unsent text messages and phone calls with friends that end in, I gotta go, my kids are. Confession, my boys run my household. Every day I wake up and I am a mom. Coincidentally, I am a wife, I am a daughter and a sister, I'm a teacher and a coach, I'm also a friend, but I tend to forget that I am a person too. Confession. Sometimes my oldest son calls me Melissa when I don't answer his first few, mom, 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 yelps from the other room. I don't hate it. I realize that I'm a person. Confession. I love when my husband calls me by my first name when our children are around instead of my name. Hey mom, do you know where the kids' shoes are? Shoes, coats, hats, blankets, and stuffed animals. Pick a train to take in the car. Pack a bag with a change of clothes and maybe a diaper for the little one. It takes 20 minutes to actually leave from the moment you utter the phrase, okay, we're leaving now. 
The work it takes to get ready to have this mass exodus is nothing short of a Broadway production or a miracle some days. Confession. I have left the house without deodorant on and only eyeliner on one eye. <laughs> Multiple times. Once I got to work with my slippers on and I was thankful for the random flip-flops that I found in the back seat. Confession. I have gotten so worked up and sweaty getting everyone ready to leave that I looked like I had my first menopausal hot flash. <laughs> P.S. Sorry, Mom, for making fun of you all those years. Confession. I have put the wrong shoes on the wrong kid and then told the one squeezed into the smaller pair to stop complaining. <laughs> as frustrating and hectic as life can be, Parenting can be one of the most amazing moments of our days, in addition to the nerve-wracking crazy and chaos. The emotional intervals can be altogether exhausting, from the joy of watching the littles master a new skill and come up with the most hilarious responses to situation can be combated with the annoyances of picking up the same mess twice or three or four times and wiping pee off the floor and down the front of the toilet from both your children and your husband. <laughs> then the euphoria returns, watching your babes hold hands in the parking lot because your hands are full, or share trains instead of help them at each other. Confession, I have ugly cried in the shower when the point of emotional exhaustion becomes too much. Confession, I have sat and watched every single video I have ever recorded on my phone before when my husband took the kids out of the house so I could get something done, I missed them. Confession. I have walked up and down every single aisle at Target when I am kid free just because I could. <laughs> Unfortunately, I actually use my kids to my advantage in some ways I'm not proud of. I have always had a problem with punctuality. Like, as in I am never early and hardly ever on time. Now that I am a mom, I can say, sorry, it was really rough getting the kids out of the house. And everyone magically understands. <laughs> I can order a meal from the kids' menu, which is actually for me, without judgmental looks or declines from the wait staff. In addition to these abuses of parental power, I have discovered some clever hacks and ways to blame things on my children along the way. But I've also acquired some bizarre habits <laughs> and likes because of my tiny humans. I have snacks for the kids in the cabinet, but I hide my good stuff in the crock pots because nobody's looking there. <laughs> I don't buy birthday cards anymore. The kids create beautiful masterpieces on computer paper. We call it a day. Confession. I have watched the remainder of animated shows after my kids have left the room or fallen asleep just because I wanted to see what happened. <laughs> Confession. We go to multiple Halloween and Easter events all over Northwest Indiana so we can replenish the candy bowl. <laughs> Confession. I don't sort laundry. I wash everything on cold. I don't iron either. That's what the tumble function is for on the dryer. <laughs> Confession. I actually sleep better with my kids. I plan my kids' birthday parties like a year in advance. And I love taking family pictures with coordinating outfits. Confession. Sometimes my kids get the iPad for a very long stretch of time because otherwise nobody would have clean underwear, bowls for their cereal, and mommy wouldn't have her sanity. <laughs> Motherhood is like riding a roller coaster with no seat belts in a blizzard with a fear of heights all while wearing a tiara. <laughs> Motherhood is like changing a flat tire of a monster four by four in the rain and darkness with only a bobby pin, package of wet wipes, and stale goldfish crackers. <laughs> After 
through confessing my mommy's sins and admitting my motherly deficiencies, I realized that this is a necessary part of motherhood. Forgiving yourself for not getting it all done. Laughing at the things that don't work out. Enjoying the silly songs, animated shows, as long as it's not Caillou. And playing trains on the floor while the dishes pile up in the sink. Moms are unique creatures with superpowers and tragic flaws. Moms are mystical and strong, sometimes with broken wings and crooked tiaras. Every day I am a mom, and that will never change, nor would I want it to. My mom always assures me that everything works out and everything gets done, just not maybe how you thought or had hoped, but it's fine. Confession. I hate it that she's usually right. <laughs> Confession. I'm surely glad she is. Thank you, Melissa. Get some special effects there at the end, too, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> busy parents rarely have time to be well busy together. You know where this is going, don't you? Jamie L. Talabani shares an, ex an embarrassing, funny, and well, awkward story of a night she and her husband tried to sneak some time together and how her son maybe might be scarred for life. <laughs> I present to you Jamie reading Mating. Jamie, we're ready for this one. Finally, a night off while we're both home. This alone is unusual enough to make the night seem romantic, despite the diapers and the dishes and the not quite dry laundry I'm folding anyway, because at this point, at least it's clean. Bedtime. My husband and I sneak quick glances at each other over the kids' heads as we get through the routine. Baths, books, kisses, back scratches, a drink of water. Can you check on their mind bed? Don't forget to pray. Another drink of water. I forgot to brush my teeth. Another drink of water. I don't feel so good. A quick change of sheets. See all those previous drinks of water. Finally, it seems, seems being the operative word here, we'll circle back shortly, that everyone is settled. Another long look, a high five, because once again, we've gotten through the day together. Everyone is alive, safe, and mostly content, except for the fact that we still don't own a Nintendo Switch. A kiss, a nudge towards the bed, and then I throw up a hard stop. I have not shaved my legs in 10 days. Let's meet back in 15 minutes. And meet back we do. I peek in and check on the kids one last time. Then we close our door, twist the lock, shimmy out of clothes and into bed. And for a few minutes, it's a little like the days when it was just the two of us. Shy smiles and giggles, still some butterflies. We should do this more often, I whisper. And then, just as it's a little hard to catch my breath, uh, what was that? Don't worry, my husband says. The cats are just running around. I'm on high alert, but I stop. Focus. This, us, is important. Everything is fine. Everything is not fine. <laughs> The door slams open, and there stands my seven-year-old son. Despite the blankets, our position is compromising at best. Time slows down, and in the seconds it takes my body to catch up with my brain and react, I think, this is bad. <laughs> Why was it so funny when it happened on Modern Family? This is not funny. How is he going to explain this to his therapist someday? How am I going to explain it to my therapist this week? This couldn't possibly get worse. Spoiler alert, it does get worse. Then, as we're trying to gracefully untangle without creating even more questions to answer over blueberry waffles tomorrow morning, my son starts to vomit. Not a little. 
a lot. And then he starts to cry. Can somebody help me? But no, nobody can because our clothes are on the floor across the room. So I send my feverish, vomiting, sobbing firstborn away, alone, to wait for me in the bathroom on a tile floor. We scramble back into our clothes, shoot each other apologetic looks, and team up. One of us takes the pile of puke with the carpet cleaner, and one of us helps the shivery, sick boy into the shower. And I cross my fingers that he thinks this was all some fever dream. <laughs> Two days later, I'm sitting on the couch, when that same seven-year-old boy, back to his precocious self, walks out of his bedroom, plops down on the couch, and asks, So, you and Daddy made it? Shit. Shit. Shitty shit shit. I am not prepared for this. Half the point of stopping at two boys is I get out of this conversation. This isn't supposed to be my territory. His dad is supposed to have this talk. Um, I eloquently, authoritatively, maturely reply as I simultaneously beg God to let the ground swallow me up and also come up with a scientifically correct explanation that I can get out without stammering and blushing. You know, he says, like for me and Crash to be born. This is what I get. This is what I get for having sex and ignoring all those I don't feel goods. I didn't believe in karma till right now. I'm gonna have to jump in with both feet. I'm a nurse. I have awkward conversations with complete strangers without batting an eyelash every day. I can explain sexual intercourse to my seven-year-old. Uh, well, I mean, I know how we got out already. I didn't know humans mated, but I figured it out from wild crats. That's it. No more PBS. What was I thinking? I am done donating for educational programming once a season. Look where it's gotten me. Oh, okay, um, well, yes. Okay, I'm ready. I can do this. The sperm, the egg, I'm ready. I'm about to ace motherhood. Factual and sex positive. Deep breath, we can do this. I'm just wondering, do humans mate for life or just for seasons? Oh, um, it depends. Oh, okay. And he stood up and walked away, and that was that. We all went back to watching TV. My heart rate returned to normal, and so far it seems like he's fairly well adjusted. You know, as well adjusted as any of us are. No sweat. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Everything's fine here. Uh, P.S. We did go ahead and order a book that explained the ins and outs, as it were, of the whole mating process. I managed to stick to the facts without blushing, and he listened halfway interested. I'm pretty sure he understood the basics, but when he spills the beans to your kid on the playground, it's going to be several mostly right facts and a bunch of words that will embarrass you when your kid spits them out in the Walmart checkout lane. So, sorry. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You know, uh, being on stage isn't an easy thing. I know the first couple of times we did our comedy shows, we were a little nervous up there. Um, the difference between that and what you saw tonight is we weren't exactly burying our souls to a room of total strangers. So to our participants tonight, you have our utmost respect and admiration. Thank you very much. As we bring our evening together to a close, we'd like to have Carrie come up and join us for some final words. Thank you all for joining this evening. First of all, I'd like to, whoa, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, can we have a round of applause of how much you enjoyed the show? Tom and Michelle for emceeing this evening, um, and I really feel like they did a, a terrific, terrific job, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and 
And wow, what a show. I'd like to thank the cast for their courage to share their stories, and I hope your hearts were touched by them this evening. If you'd like, please remain in the audience, and the cast would love to chat with you afterwards. At this time, I'd like the staff, the cast, ooh, this is getting loud, to stand up, and um, we have some flowers for them. So with further ado, let's have a big bow. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming this evening. Good job, guys. 